Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Brian Tipper. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing here at OptiWave and I'll be sitting alongside your host, Scott Newman. In this particular webinar, we're going to take a closer look at some advanced features in OptiFTC. During the presentation, you're going to see three polls. Please take a couple seconds to answer them as the information is very useful to us in guiding the presentation. We also have two Q&A periods, the first one at the 20 minute mark roughly and the second one at the end of this session. So feel free to uh, go ahead and use the questions panel and type any questions that you have in there and we'll try to answer everything during the session. Now over, over in the uh, handout section, you'll find the PDF that's used in this presentation. Feel free to download that at any time. And finally, please note that this webinar will be recorded and distributed to all registrants tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time via email. So you get the email with the uh, link. Just go ahead and click the link and it'll take you to the video. For some people, you might have to type your information and again, your name that you used, your email, and um, then you'll have to click the register button and that'll take you directly to the, uh, the video link. Now that we've got all that information cleared out of the way, I'll hand you over to our Opti FTC project lead, Scott Newman. Thanks, Brian. I just want to uh, welcome everybody into the webinar. We're going to continue our, our trend of more tutorial style. Um, just want to make sure my screen is showing here. There we go. Um, I'd like, we're going to continue our trend here of taking a look at a more of a tutorial style where we go through um, how to set some of the things up that might make your life easier when you're using the uh, Opti FTTD product. And today what we're going to be looking at is two aspects, which is setting up parameters, um, which allow you to tie a lot of physical specifications for your designs into one or two variables. And then the other is creating scripts using VB script to actually be able to um, automate some of the functions so that you yourself don't have to do those. Um, the, in combination, these can be used to do things such as design optimization or convergence testing, and they, they free up the designer um, quite a bit to be able to, uh, to do some more advanced stuff. So this particular webinar, we're going to do, be predominantly in the, uh, the, desi the designer. So I'm going to just bring us over to that so we can take a look. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is just playing around with these these parameter sets um, that we can create. And as a rule of thumb, I, I parameterize pretty much everything when I'm setting up a simulation. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at first our simulation domain, one of the first things you have to set up when you when you run a simulation. And anywhere where you see one of these, these function icons um, or an asterisk, they actually allow you to write in math, math expressions if you want them. So 20 plus 2 will end up giving us 22. Or what's a bit more powerful is we can set them to parameters. In this case, I'm going to set these to L and W. And as I hit OK, what you're going to see is it's going to warn us that those aren't defined and ask me to define them. So I'm going to hit OK. It's warning us that these are unknown. So we're going to go in. And this is where I need to actually create these. So I'm going to create one called L, and I'm going to make it 10. And I'm going to add it. So we've created a new user variable that allows us to um, reference. The other thing, to, important thing to keep in mind here as I add my next one, which is my W, I'm going to make that 6 and add it. This also can be expressions. So for example, if I wanted to, I could make this 2 times L, in which case what it will actually do is come out as 20. So you can add math there if you want as well. I generally tend to stay away from it. I'd prefer just other parameters. So we're going to make sure that's there. We're getting a warning that the variable already exists, making sure we don't overwrite things without realizing it. And we're going to go ahead and do that. Now we see that the simulation space automatically resizes to the new uh, dimensions, the 10 by 6. And I'm going to go ahead and add a an input plane just to make this a, a complete design. And I'm also going to add an observation line. I'm going to put it right here at 9. And when I go into the observation line, this is where we can actually start tying in some of these, these parameters that we've defined. I want it to be 0 on the vertical axis so that it actually is centered right here. 
So I'll make that zero and I'm going to make sure there's no offset. Again, these offsets, uh, we've discussed these before, but the offsets are used to offset any expression that you put into here if, if that's something you might need. Variables go, and equations go into here, just straight numbers go into here. But for the horizontal, for this design, what I want is I want that observation plane to be one micron away from the end of the simulation space. And that horizontal axis goes from zero out to 10. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it as L minus one. I'm gonna make sure that offset is zero and I'm gonna evaluate to make sure things are right. So this observation line should show up at a vertical position of zero and nine. And I'm going to make the length of it, I want it to be across the entire space. So I make it W and I hit OK and we define this new uh, observation line. I'm also going to create a linear waveguide. I'm just going to use the default um, properties. There's both default material and a default waveguide profile that gets created when you create a new simulation. So I'm going to open up this waveguide and take a look at these properties. Now this is where we define the start and end for the waveguide. The start I want to happen at the the far left, which is zero, and I want it to be I want it to actually show up in the half halfway in the halfway mark, so a quarter of the way up from the center. So what we're actually going to do is going to make that W by four. And we're going to make sure our offsets are zero so they don't interfere with our expressions. And we also need to specify our end. Now this I want the end to be all the way out to the far right. So I want that to go out to L. I want my offset to be zero. And again, my vertical is going to be the W by four. So it's in that top half, halfway between the origin and the edge. Uh, evaluating, double checking. This looks good. I would, we'll just make it a default width of one. The depth is what controls its uh, thickness in the Y, in the into and out of the screen uh, axis. And I'll just leave it with the default label. This is that default profile I'm I was talking about. It has a default material assigned to it. And it's the, it's the default one that gets created if you don't create new waveguide profiles or new materials. So I'm just showing the parameters. So we'll stick with that for now. And I'm gonna hit okay. And now we see our waveguide go from left to right in this top half, but let's say for, Design team comes in, they say, no, no, we want the simulation bit domain to be twice this size. You don't want to have to go in to each component and move them around. So what we can do is we go up to simulation, hit edit parameters, and we're going to double click on the L, and we're going to make it 20. We want to apply that. It's going to warn us. So we hit OK, and then we're also going to change, oops, there we go. I'm going to change the W, and again, it's going to warn us, let us know that we're overwriting it. And as I hit OK here, the design is going to rescale to those new dimensions. But because we used parameters, not only did the simulation get larger, but the observation line and the waveguide changed to reflect those, those that change to the design that we wanted. And this is only one of the first kind of glimpses of what parameters will let us do. What's more important is we can actually sweep these parameters. So I'm going to go ahead and close this particular design. And I'm going to open up our examples here. And as I open these up, and I want basic parameters. Grading. Sorry. Sorry about that. I, could not see the design I wanted. There we are. Now, this is a, a grading example we did from a, the last webinar in which we've got grading thickness of 0.1 and a periodicity of 0.2 microns. And the refractive indexes were chosen so that we got a Bragg reflection at 300 terahertz, which is all well and good, but what if you wanted to take a look at fluctuating that duty cycle? The, the, i.e. the width of the grading versus the period. Nobody wants to sit there and set up a whole bunch of simulations and run each one of them changing those settings. That's why where parameters come in handy. And not only are parameters handy in the sense, 
But when we set up this grading back when we did this yesterday, we didn't create each one of these gradings. We actually used the photon crystal component to create the, the periodic structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into this periodic structure. We're going to leave all of this the same. This is what controls our period, how many gradings we want to see. What I want to change up here is this, this linear waveguide is what defines each of these atoms. And we're going to edit that. And instead of running from point one, so the, the design starts here, instead of moving point one in and going to point two, what I want to do is I'm going to have it start at something called thickness and move it to two times thickness. And again, when I hit OK, because I haven't already created that, it's letting me know. So I go to the space and I create my parameter. And I'm going to make it 0 0.1. Now, we won't see anything change right now because that was the original thickness of these gradings. I just set up the parameter so I can actually demonstrate and show you a parameter sweep. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to simulation and down here we see parameter sweep. And this will allow us to set up um, multi-levels of, of sweeps if we wanted to. Right now I'm going to set up just one. We want to sweep this thickness. We want to sweep it from a thickness of 0.1 all the way out to a thickness of 0.2 where they all touch and become one block of material. So I'm going to hit parameters to see what parameters I can sweep. In this case we just have the one which is thickness. I'm going to accept that. Now we see here we have level one. I can add other levels if we add other parameters. So th these would be nested, effectively nested loops. You would change one parameter, then run the sweep on another parameter, change the first one, run the sweep again, and so on and so forth. So you would have these, these big nested loops. In this case, we, we only want to loop this thickness, so we're going to stick with that. I'm going to click on the parameter I want to sweep, select the, the options up here, and I'm going to tell it I want a linear um, spacing from 1 to 5, and I want my start value to, to be our original point 1, and I want it to roll out to point 2. So when I hit OK, it's going to rescale, so the thickness will be 1, point 1, sorry, point 1, point 1, 2, 5, and so on. You can also change the number of iterations by editing the properties at the level, and you can set your iteration count to be whatever iteration number of iterations you want. Keep in mind, if you change the number of iterations, you will need to reset what you want your spread to be. But for now, this is good for us. And that, that is it for a parameter sweep. So what we do is we go over to 2D simulation. And just to recap for those of us who, uh, who weren't with us yesterday, I've defined the mesh size so that I get 10 points across one of these gratings um, at the, their smallest size. I've set up the, the length of the simulation so that we make sure we get all of the power out of the grading back across our observation plane. And I've also set up periodic boundary conditions along this positive x and the negative x to make sure that this rectangular wave we've set up here is actually a plane wave. The final thing we need to check and verify is we go to this DFT spectrum. This is what um, guides what frequency range we're actually going to do any DFTs that get done during the simulation for us. Since we want to look at a stop band at 300 terahertz, we're going to set the start frequency to 200 terahertz and the end frequency to 400. So we're just going to look at that one stop band. We're going to do 100 samples, so all of this looks okay. And now we're going to run the simulation. The one thing you want to check when you're doing a parameter sweep is you want to make sure this check mark is here to indicate to the software that you want to use the sweep that you've set up. If this is unchecked, we will only run one simulation with these parameters with whatever layout that is specified at that time. So we're going to use the sweep, we're going to hit run, and this will now run. There's five of them, they're, they're relatively quick simulations, so we're just going to let them run now. But what we should expect to see is at the first run, we should expect to see a reflection band at 300 terahertz, or the wavelength equivalent of it, and as it gets to the point two, we should see that reflection band go away, or stabilize to something normal, because now you just have a brick of material with a, a very specific reflectance. So, that's already run.
Now what we do is we go to our file explorer. So you want to make sure you're in the same folder as the simulation file that, that you ran. And what you'll see is you'll see, now you'll see five FDA or analyzer files. You, this one here doesn't have a number and then you have one, two, three, four. So we can take a look at the results from any one of these. So for example, if I take a look at the first one, if I really want to just look at it, I can take a look at the power spectrum and we see this reflectance band. But the whole point of this was so that we didn't have to check each one of these. So, so what we have to do here is we open up the last one. We ran five simulations, so grading 004. And when you open up that one, if we take a look at tools and we look at parameter sweep analysis, this will actually allow us to take a look at the results from all of the simulations. So I'm going to specify that I want to look at this power spectrum along that observation line that I called R. And we see automatically this is that reflectance band at uh, a thickness of 0.1. So it's, it's a little over one and the, the shape isn't that great. That's because of the, con this was not run at convergence because we want to keep the simulation small for, for our test here so we can run within the, the span of a webinar. But let's take a look here. What happens if those gratings get larger and the period doesn't? Well, we see that the reflection band not only shifts, but it actually gets smaller. And then as the gratings get bigger, it continues to shift and get smaller, continue to shift and get smaller, until we hit point two, where those gratings are so large that they're now overlapped. So now we just have a solid brick of material and we get this, I'm going to turn off the other ones, we get this fa fairly, well, it doesn't look flat here, but it's, it's curved over a span of only 0 0.02 in terms of normalized power. If I put it relative to one of the other ones, we see we actually have a fairly, uh, a fairly flat uh, reflectance there. Uh, so that's all I want to show with the, the observation. Um, the observation planes and doing a parameter sweep. I'm going to hand it back to Brian now so we can take care of that second poll. And when we come back, we're going to go and take a look at setting up scripts and actually really making the, taking advantage of these parameters. Okay, so uh, second poll is up for everybody. Um, again, uh, this is our first uh, question and answer break, so uh, please get your questions in now if you'd like to uh, ask Scott anything on the first half of his presentation. Um, I'll give it a couple seconds here and I'll just uh, go ahead and check the uh, schedule coming up in the next two days for you guys. So it looks like tomorrow we're going to be doing uh, advanced applications on FEC at 3 p.m. Um, and then we're going to be doing it at 3 p.m. on Friday as well. That's Eastern Standard Time. So uh, go ahead and register for those sessions as well. You can just do that on our website. And uh, let me give it a, a couple more seconds here. Um, just I, I think there's a couple people that are uh, formulating questions. And I also wanted to note that uh, if you guys have any uh, questions about evaluations or uh, you'd like to have a, a quotation on any of the software packages, you can email info at operate.com. And anything that uh, you weren't able to ask during this session or during any of the other sessions, you can email support at operate.com. That goes out to everybody. Or uh, I believe Scott's also going to provide his, uh, his email address. So you can go ahead and email him directly as well. Uh, either or, it'll go to him in both ways. So. I'll go ahead and close the poll now and I'll hand it back to Scott to uh, answer any questions. Okay, thanks Brian. Yeah, I, I forgot to uh, mention about the email. Um, I do have the des these design files, they'll be available. My email address is actually on the front page of the presentation that's been attached as a handout. So it's scott.newman at optiwave.com. But we can also be contacted at uh, support at optiwave.com. So we're going to jump right into uh, taking a look at scripting. So if we take a look at InDesigner, let's open that back up for us. So if we take a look, let's even open up that grading for example, just so I can uh, open these up. You, you'll notice there's a scripting tab. This is where we can actually create a VB script that will tie into various APIs that have been made available 
There is a full manual with all of the functions that you can call that is included within the installation um, of Opti FDTD. Um, but one good thing that you, we can do is we, we've added these. So once you go into your scripting window, these icons up here pop up, and they will actually generate basic scripts for you. So for example, you say you want to do a scanning script to do some kind of optimization. If I just click here, yeah, it'll overwrite the current script. There isn't one, so that's not a concern. It'll actually set up the preliminary stuff for you. It'll number of iterations, set up the for loop. This is a call to actually run the simulation and then uh, a wait to make sure all the files are stabilized after simulation. But one of the interesting things is that if I do this layout script, again, it's going to warn me that it'll overwrite the script, but that's fine. It'll actually generate a default script for you that will create the layout that you already have. So if you're trying to figure out, when it, it's a really useful tool when you're trying to learn the scripting and how to set things up. Um, so that's one thing for, for learning it that's, that's very useful. But we're going to go into very specific scripts that I've already set up for us here. And the first one is one I tend to use quite frequently. And it's a convergence script. So again, this is that grading um, we've, been, we've been looking at. And one of the things we've talked about previously, and I, I stress with pretty much every uh, support interaction I have, is you have to make sure your simulation is run with a high enough mesh size that it can properly characterize not only the wavelength of the source, but also the smallest features of your structure. And one of the easiest, though time-consuming, ways of doing that is a convergence check, i.e. you run multiple simulations with multiple resolutions and you, you see how your answer is converging with that result. So what I've done, because I don't want to change those mesh sizes all the time, check it, copy down the result, compare the results, plot it, I've written a script that will actually do that for me. So if we take a look at the script, what it consists of, again, this is VB based, it's a VB script. So for those of you who are from, familiar with VBA or Visual Basic, it, it's a variant of that. So the general syntax um, is very familiar, should be familiar to you. So initially up here, I set up my variables. I'm going to run four iterations for this particular example. I specify how long I want each simulation to be, in this case 0.4 picoseconds. And I also specify what I want my first mesh size to be. In this case, it's 0.05 microns. I also set up speed of light for for use in later calculations. The second part here, and this is the part um, I enjoyed when I discovered we actually can do this, was that we can actually tie directly into other applications. In this case, we actually create an Excel object and we can actually add to it and work with it. Um, so for example, we create it, then we go into our iterations and we will store our data in that Excel file um, and have it, it shown to us. So we go into the loop. It's going to run through, obviously, each one of the iterations I want it to. Each iteration takes the original step size, which is 0.05, and we'll divide it by some order of two. First iteration, it'll be 0.05. Second iteration, it'll be 0.025. Third iteration, it'll be 0.0125, and so on and so forth. Based on that, and st the Courant stability factor, we calculate our step size. Note, I'm actually running a much smaller step size than is necessary for the Courant. Um, that's just a personal preference. I, I always tend to do that. And then for the this capital N is the number of steps um, that will be required to give me the 0.4 picoseconds. Then we s specify the step size in X, Z time and the number of steps. This is where we actually set it for the simulation and then we call our simulation. After we waited to make sure files stabilize and update and everything, we access the observation point manager where our observation line exists and we tell it to give us the power at the central wavelength. We store that in a variable and then what we do is we store in one row of the Excel spreadsheet, we store the step size, and then we store that power that we just observed. When it's done the loop, it will actually expose the Excel spreadsheet, um, and we can take a look at our results. So I'm going to go ahead and run that now. 
So we'll go 2D simulation. Notice this time we've indicated we want it to simulate using the script, not using the, the, a sweep. And then we're going to go ahead and hit run. So I've set it up to do four. So when we take a look at our iteration number, it uses the C++ uh, syntax of 0, 1, 2, 3. So the third one will be our final simulation. And if you take a look at your, again, your, your Explorer window, I want to look at my desktop in my folder, what you'll see it is it's actually creating a file for each of these. So it's working on the final one right now. I apparently specified I wanted five, so that's fine. And we're just going to wait for this one to finish off. No, I specified four. Three is the fourth one. So while we're waiting for that, I just saw one question come in about um, the ideal, um, what your ideal mesh size should be. And yes, Lambda by 10 is kind of the ballpark that most people use. Um, you got to keep in mind that has to be the smallest lambda if you're using a pulse source, as well as that's the lambda in the highest index material. But one of the things that catch a lot of people off guard is they, they forget that their structures can actually be smaller than their wavelengths. This is very common in photon crystal work and a lot of brag grading work. Uh, so convergence testing is always useful, but yeah, I would definitely run, um, I generally run the lambda by 10 or what I think a, a lambda by 10 should be and then I, I half it. I basically half that, see how good it gets, half it again, see how good it gets. Um, the other reason I do halves is by doing halves you can actually do something called, a, uh, if you look it up online, it's called a Richardson extrapolation. You can actually use the Richardson extrapolation to actually calculate past what resolutions you've got to figure out what your converged value should be so you can figure out how close you actually are. So these are the results that came out of those files. You can actually take a look at each one if you want, but this is the Excel spreadsheet that we actually populated. And just quickly to show you what I do is highlight those and I just create a quick chart so I can take a look at whether it looks like it's converged. We had some pretty big changes here and then it does look like it's starting to converge. I would definitely, pers um, in, a per in my opinion, run one or two more simulations to make sure that this is leveled off and not starting to ret return up or something uh, bizarre like that. Um, but in the time frame of the, the webinar, that's these are the simulations we've run. So that's that's a useful script, um, one I tend to use a lot whenever I get a, a support question. One of the things I do is I do take a look at whether it's converged. Um, in relation to that, I have been asked if the script's going to be made available. Um, the GoToWebinar won't let us attach an FDT file, um, even if it's zipped. So what I'd ask if, it, if anybody actually wants a... Uh, a copy of this script or any of the design files that I'm showing today, just send me or uh, support at OptiWave.com an email and we can definitely make those available to you. So that's the first script we're going to take a look at. The second one is going to be actually an optimization one, which is one that I find uh, I found particularly useful in the past. So if we close this, we're going to go back to our main window and open up the optimization script. So this particular one is a photon crystal waveguide. So for those of you not familiar with photonic crystals, photonic crystals are periodic structures that based on their physical parameters, in, in this case it would be the spacing between the holes, uh, rods, my apologies, spacing between the rods and the radius of those rods. Based on those parameters, there will be bands of frequencies that will not allow propagation. So there'll be reflection bands or stop bands. And there will be bands that actually allow propagation. The idea of a photon crystal waveguide is you propagate, in this case it is a one, uh, I just opened up the properties for the input plane. It's a 1.7 micron source. So the idea being this photonic crystal doesn't allow 1.7 microns to propagate through it. But by removing a, a line, what, what's known as a line defect, creating a line defect, the light will be allowed to travel through the defect, 
but not actually be able to travel through the material. But one of the design tricks you've got to figure out is you've got to figure out what that, what's known as the R over A ratio to be, and that is the radius of the holes versus the spacing or the lattice uh, spacing of the, of the structure. And you could sit there and, and change these parameters over and over and over and rerun simulations, or we could set up a script. So one thing that will make things more useful, I'm going to open up the properties for that photonic crystal, and I'm actually going to edit the the structure that's that's repeated, what's known as the atom. So if I go in there, you'll notice that the major and minor radius, this is set up as it could be an ellipse. Both the major and the minor radius are set up to be a parameter, in this case R. That parameter is something that we're going to use in our script. So if I cl oh, close that there and close that one, we're going to take a look at this script. So what this script does is so we declare our variables, initialize our variables. We're going to do five iterations. And what it's going to do is it's going to run the radius of those, whole, those atoms from a maximum of 0.4 microns to a minimum of 0.2 microns. And it's going to do it in step sizes to give us five iterations. So we've got some, some variables that will hold what the best value is. And then we set, we set up our file. This particular one doesn't use Excel. It writes to a CSV file. Um, this is just a little function that we created to write to a file. And then we get into this actual loop. So what actually happens here is we calculate what the radius needs to be for this particular iteration. We actually set the parameter to that value. And then we run our, our simulation. Once the simulation is done, we obtain the power at the central wavelength of the observation line. Same idea as we did with the convergence test. But this time what we actually do is we take a look at that value and compare it to what we think is the best value. We initialize that to zero. Um, so the first one will obviously get set to there. But if we, as we change the, the radius, we're going to hit one where we get potentially, hopefully, 100% transmission. That would be the, the best one. So if we hit one, we'll select we'll store what that one is in terms of what the power was and in terms of what that radius was and we'll keep track of what the previous chosen ones were. An extra handy little feature is in this in this particular one what it actually does is every time we run an iteration we create one of these FDA files. So let's say for example you want 100 iterations. You don't want 100 FDA files because you really don't care about the FDA files that don't have the property that you want. This particular script will actually delete any FDA file that doesn't satisfy the condition, in this case, the largest amount of transmitted power. So when we run our simulation, even though I've asked for five iterations, you'll notice that only one FDA file will remain, and that will be the one from the simulation that has the highest transmission power. And then once that done is done, we call a, a function, which is down here, which is just a, a script for writing to the file. The reason it's, it's an extra function is just there's, there's a bit of formatting that we do in here. We also add in a command so that it checks to see whether we're testing the script or actually running it in the simulator, um, and it'll decide whether to run it or not. So I'm going to go ahead and run this, and we'll take a look at it here. So I'm going to go to the 2D simulation. Now, ah, actually, before I run that, one of the important things to note is that this particular simulation, all of the iterations will have this mesh size. And in the turn, this particular um, duration. Now, keep in mind what I said to, in answer to uh, the previous question there about, about mesh sizing. If we are ranging the size of these, whole, these rods, if the smallest rod size is smaller than what can be modeled by this resolution, you're actually going to not get a really good map of what's happening because one result's going to be well converged and the other won't be. So one of the things I would, I would personally do if I were to rewrite the script again is in here, in the script, when I determine the, the mesh size, uh, sorry, this, I would do one of two things. I could change the mesh size to represent 
this particular radius to make sure all of the holes had kind of the same spatial um, characterization, i.e. there's 10 or 15 points on average per hole. Or what I would do is I would sit down with a piece of paper, take a look at the smallest uh, radius size I would use, and then calculate my resolution based on that. But anyways, that's, that's neither here nor there. That doesn't happen in this script. It is all run with one particular resolution. So I'm going to go ahead and run that now, and it's going to run these five. So, so I'm just going to let that run. They're relatively fast. We, we chose a fairly um, a low resolution for that, so just to keep things in terms of reasonable. And we're just about on our last one here. Perfect. Now, if we go back to our, our original command, we'll notice that the, the name of this project that I'm running here is scripting optimization. So we, we see we have a scripting optimization.fdt, fdt, and you'll notice that there is only one FDA file. Before, when we ran the convergence test, or the per, or, which is this one here, or when we ran the parameter suit, we actually get an FDA file for every iteration that gets run. This particular script was coded so that it deleted any, uh, any results file that didn't match that maximum power that we were looking for. And the reason for that is this script is designed to potentially run 30 or 40 or 100 iterations, and you don't want to have to fish through all of those. So we take a look at the output file that was created by that script, and what we'll see is it shows us each of the radiuses that were calculated, and then it will show us the power at the central wavelength for each of those simulation. So in this co context, the one that gave us the maximum power was at 0 0.35, that, and that was simulation 0, 1, 2, 3, and you'll notice that's the FDA file that we have. So if you actually run much high, larger number of iterations, you'll find the optimum case is around 0 0.34, so we're pretty close. Um, the difference being the maximum power is actually 0 0.9 instead of 0 0.6. So that's just a function of me trying to keep things within the, uh, the context of a webinar. Uh, the one last thing I want to show, and it, it'll be a super quick one, is let's say, for example, you have a really complicated design and you do not want to have to create this thing again and again and again. So we're going to go to this last design here. And we'll notice this one, there appears to be nothing here. It, it's got a length of 20 microns, a width of, uh, should be 15, yep. So what this one has is nothing, because I haven't copied the script in yet, because I want to show you that that could be done as well. So here we have a design script. I've stored it in a Word document. And if I take this script and I copy it into this window, what this script actually does is it creates the whole design for us. It creates the input plane, the observation line, the, the structures, everything. So if we go ahead and hit play on this script and we take a look at layout, we actually have a, suddenly we have a photonic crystal waveguide structure. In this case, it's designing a splitter. So there are three sections, one that defines the waveguide, one that defines the split, and then one defines the parallel waveguides. And if we take a look at the script, it follows a very similar fashion to what we did before. It defines its variables. Then we go ahead and we define the first section. So we define, we have a nested loop that runs horizontally and vertically, creating the rods that need to be created. We have the section that creates the splitter, again, doing uh, an, a nested loop across X and Y. And then you have the, the parallel waveguides. And finally, we define the input field, and the uh, this is setting our waveguides and the observation points. Now, this one was relatively straightforward. You could have created this one on your own fairly easily, but let's say, for example, you wanted to model surface roughness on, on a wafer. You could actually define a script that would define your wafer and then randomly generate points that could simulate surface roughness, and then you could run your simulations. You don't want to have to randomly create these dots. 
but you can in in the VB script you could actually create a for loop that would iterate through as many random dots as you'd want. So in, I hope this was useful for anyone who, who really wants to try and optimize and make their use of OptiFTTD efficient. Um, I encourage anyone who has the software to play with the scripting. It's uh, it's really rewarding when you actually get something, particularly something like a convergence script running, and you can just hit 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 run and and leave for the night and come back to results. So with that, I'll uh, return it over to Brian so we can do, I believe, the final poll, and I'll take a look at some of the questions that have been coming in. Okay, so the uh, final poll is up for everybody. If you could take a couple seconds to answer that, and if uh, for anybody that's been monitoring their chat window, I've uh, thrown the uh, link down there for the uh, webinar week uh, uh, web page, so you can click on that link to get a quite a bit of information. You can sign up for the additional sessions. You post the uh, uh, the people that qualified for the draw. There's a there's a PDF beside the actual webinar, and then there's the, the winners. Uh, semi-encrypted uh, name and email address uh, uh, just to, uh, to show uh, who the winner is to the group. Um, the uh, $50 gift cards go out at the end of every day, so uh, you should expect that if you're one of the winners to get it uh, within the next hour or so. And also, the, as mentioned in the previous sessions, all the recorded webinars, they get sent out 24 hours after the close of each webinar. So You'll receive this uh, recording tomorrow at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it will be available if you want to get it before then uh, by going to the same link that you used to sign up. Um, it takes about 30 minutes to render the video, uh, so it should be up around 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, all that you have to do is you click on the same link you used to register. It looks like you have to register again because you have to put your name in. Email and then hit the register button. But what it does is it just takes you directly to the video recording. And also, uh, for those of you that might be looking for Scott's email, I threw it in the chat window as well, so you can just copy and paste it if you uh, wanted to get a hold of some of the material that he was uh, presenting, such as the uh, script that he mentioned. And uh, I think that's good for the poll. I'll go ahead and close it and pass the uh, mic back to Scott. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, there, were, there aren't uh, any questions specifically about the scripting, but I, I did get an excellent one here that I do want to address, and it was in regards to um, a, me asking for me to ballpark a kind of typical order of magnitude for what length an FTTD simulation can be without running out of memory. And it's a bit of a loaded question in the sense that uh, there's a lot of variables that actually go into answering that. So, for example, the lambda by 10 rule for FDTD requires that you have 10 spatial steps for each wa um, for a wavelength. So, if I have a one micron wavelength, I need a mesh size of 0.1 microns ballpark. If we have structures that are smaller than that, you should aim for resolutions that are even smaller enough to be able to characterize your, your simulation space. So, again, you can take a look at that by if we look at the 2D refractive index here. You can actually take a look and you can see, for example, that the resolution I've picked is for this one isn't very pardon me, isn't very good for modeling the holes. If we go to our 2D simulation, and let's say we don't want to use 0.08, which is that lambda by 10, let's use 0.01. We're not going to run this simulation, so I don't really worry about it being too high. What we see as it redraws, we see that the holes are much better defined. Um, so there's that one. It's going to depend on what your source wavelength is. It's going to depend on what kind of feature sizes you're using. We do also have uh, non-uniform meshing that we can implement to try and stretch that out. But the short answer is there isn't one an answer to, to that particular question. But one thing that OptiFTTD does do, and it is very useful for when you're trying to decide that answer, is if we open up either the 2D or 3D simulation window, if you specify what your mesh size is, so in this case this 0.01, A, it will tell me how many meshes I have in X and Z. It'll also tell me how many steps I have. But the important one here is this window. We don't talk about it too much in these webinars, but it's actually very useful in this, particularly in terms of this first line. It will actually estimate what the minimum memory requirement is to complete that simulation. 
So if you're running an 8 gig simulate uh, computer, you do not definitely do not want this number to go anywhere near 8 gigs. So to answer that particular question, while I can't give you a specific we can you can model 20 microns or you can model 1 meter, it's going to depend on your source, it's going to depend on your structure, but what I can tell you is that the OptiFTTD simulation parameters will tell you what kind of memory you need so that you don't try and run a simulation that will max out your memory and you find that out halfway in between uh, doing your simulation. So hopefully that's a, that kind of answers that particular question. Otherwise, the, I don't see a, any additional questions regarding the scripting. I'd like to reiterate Brian's uh, comment about uh, if you want copies of any of the scripts I've shown here or any of the design files that we've gone through today, uh, please uh, send me an email or send an email to support at optiwave.com and we, we will gladly make those available. I, I'd make them available as a handout, but unfortunately the, uh, the file types just are not liked by the GoToWebinar software, so we'll have to do it through email. Uh, with that, I'd like to again thank everybody for, for coming out and I will hand it back off to Brian to finish us off. Okay, yeah, thanks for uh, joining everybody. Uh, we have two more days of webinars uh, set up, so feel free to come to as many as you'd like and uh, definitely appreciate everybody that's attended to all the ones so far. Have a great night.